something about being told you have a limited time to live that really strips things back. There's no handbook on how to navigate dying. Being told you have an illness that is going to kill you normally brings up a lot of turmoil and despair. Will I suffer? Am I going to lose all of my dignity? Am I going to lose my identity? What people see now is the cancer, and then they see me. You just start to disappear a little bit. I got lost for a long time. I was giving over who I was to the illness. It's constantly sitting in the back of your mind, you know, should I buy that nice pair of earrings? Is this the last time I'm going to have Christmas? Rather than focusing on the living, I was getting overwhelmed by the side effects of the dying. It's a period of time where someone is very much reduced to their illness. They just can't enjoy or be present in the time that they have left. And they can really retreat or just feel gripped by this, this anxiety. In my experience, Good therapy is really difficult to find, particularly if you've got a terminal illness. I heard about this study through a group of women who have metastatic breast cancer. I felt like this was something that was different and that the experience of the psych psychedelic drug would be interesting. It's so intense. <laughs> I'm only halfway through it and it's been remarkable so far. Oh my God, excuse my French, but fuck me. <laughs> oh my Lord. Our trial through St Vincent's is the first psychedelic assisted therapy trial ever approved in Australia and we were the first people to deliver this treatment. The study is really looking at trying to reduce the experience of anxiety and depression in people who have a life-threatening illness. Good. Psilocybin really kicks the doors open. The intensity of the psilocybin experience has been likened to having, you know, 10 or 20 years of therapy in one hit. Psilocybin is the psychedelic compound which occurs in the psilocybe genre and a few other genres of mushrooms. So colloquially known as magic mushrooms and they can produce quite a, a shift in perception and, and produces an altered state of consciousness. Most participants don't really know what they're in for. Most of them come along because they've either read a book or saw something on Netflix. It's really, really hard work, and they have to work hard to get the benefit from it. This is a psychotherapy treatment. The psilocybin helps the therapy work better. Psilocybin won't cure cancer. It won't cure their terminal illness. But what we're hoping is that the treatment will help them face uh, the end of life and what's to come. I'm 58 years old. And six years ago, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer stage four. And at that stage, we were living in Korea, so didn't have any symptoms, no warning. It was a big shock. Big shock. Hello, baby. Where you been? I remember when I looked at the study and said to the kids, I'd like to do this. And they're like, really? Mum, you're going to take drugs? <laughs> I was, I was yeah. shocked. So it doesn't sound like mum at all. Um, but she was really excited, actually. So um, I thought it was cool that she's trying something new and uh, she was pretty invested in it. So I was excited for her. Yeah, I was definitely confused. Definitely did not expect this. <laughs> yeah. We created our family through intercountry adoption. So we have Min, who's 21, and Naray, who's 19 now. First photos. So that was the first time we got to see what you look like. Which is pretty cool. There's Min on the plane. Oh, wow. We've lived in South Korea twice. 
giving the kids an opportunity to live in their country of birth. Oh, this is cute. This is a Korean holiday. Lindy has led a remarkable life, a very rich life. Dad and I very, very young. She's at the minute facing some very tricky circumstances in terms of her husband, who is very reliant on her. And then a few years later, wedding. Unfortunately, my husband has early onset Alzheimer's dementia, and so I'm his full-time carer. She's mum, she's a carer, she's also sick. So, you know, she carries an enormous burden. And then, look, I remember this photo. In terms of lifespan, initially, I was told six months to two years. And so my aim back then was to get my eldest son to 18 so he could be legally responsible for his sister. Um, he's turned 21 now. So I've far surpassed what they said. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I don't actually fear the dying, the physical part of the dying. I suppose it, it's mainly about the impact on people by me not being here. I fear my kids not having a parent. So that makes me profoundly sad that these magnificent kids are gonna have their mum around and they'll physically have their dad around, but not in the sense of having a dad. It's been pretty brutal and she's had lots of despair about that. There's been lots of deep sadness, which has really washed over her. And it's really in the context of all of that that she's come along to us. I'd been working in palliative care for about seven years and in my private practice a little longer again, working with people who are facing end of life. And you do get frustrated with the limits of what you can hit. And then in 2017, there was a talk that, that Martin Williams gave and he basically put up this slide that said, this is the state of psychedelic research in Australia as it stands. And um, the next slide was, thank you for your time. <laughs> and I remember it because I was sitting in the audience and I was, you know, it was a roar of laughter, but at the same time I was like, oh, really? Yeah. About three weeks after the conference, I received an email from Marg saying that she was very interested in the potential of psychedelic uh, medicine and that she would be interested in uh, perhaps initiating a, a clinical study. Psychedelics have been used for possibly thousands of years by certain indigenous cultures around the world, particularly in Central and Southern America. And then it was in the 1940s that a Swiss chemist, uh, Albert Hoffman, uh, discovered the effects of uh, LSD. We're ready to start this experiment. The potential of psychedelics in a medical or clinical sense blossomed through the 1950s into the 60s, but then we like to say that psychedelics sort of escaped the lab. 250 micrograms apiece. Drugs like psilocybin and LSD began to be used, you know, for their sort of mind-opening qualities. Turn around, tune in, drive up. We kind of got caught up in the idea of being part of the counterculture movement. It can radically shift your perspective and it can start to make people question existing power structures. 1970s came along, war on drugs, President Nixon shut the whole thing down. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. It wasn't until the mid-1990s that research started to take place again. And really in the last five to ten years, we've seen that explosion of interest in psychedelics. Psilocybin and other classical uh, psychedelics seem to work by changing some of the interconnections among parts of our brains. People can feel warped, disembodied. They can feel as though they're floating through space. They can have visionary experiences that are just impossible to put into words, but that just come with very powerful feelings. So these experiences of awe, for some reason, kind of allows people to just go, oh, OK, I get it, you know, the death happens. It's all part of it. All right. <laughs> and there's this sort of kind of remarkable letting go. But 
it fairly reliably precipitates quite an internal focus. So therapeutically, that's gold. We can leverage that. What we know about people who have a propensity for depression or anxiety is that they can get into quite rigid, ruminative patterns and ways of thinking. People can become fixated on some of their problems. And so the psychedelics seem to break down those particular connections and then establish other connections among different parts of the brain that normally wouldn't really have very much to do with each other. What it does, the psilocybin, I think, is it allows people to look at all the things that make them who they are in a very different way. It basically takes the, um, the, the ruts in life through which experience and relationships tend to be channeled and it just fills them in a bit. It reduces your need to do things in this rigid reflex way. That's really important because then new ways of thinking and responding and behaving are possible. So that can really help um, the therapy uh, potentially work more effectively. For this to become an approved study, not only did we have to get the hospital philosophically on side, but then we had to produce a sort of trial document, a running sheet of how the trial would unfold. So this document took thousands of hours to put together. I spent about nine months on it before we submitted. And I thought, I'm going to make it really bloody hard for them to say no. <laughs> um, and. Um, they approved it. Well, in an Australian first, terminally ill patients will be given an ingredient found in magic mushrooms. It went berserk, it got front page. There were radio stations ringing us all morning. Clearly there was a massive appetite in the public for something different. We were just thumped with inquiries. The inbox was just getting absolutely chockers. Hello, is that Tess? Yes, this is Tess. Oh, good day, Tess. It's Justin Dwyer and Margaret Ross from St Vincent's Psilocybin Trial. We've had something like 5,000 expressions of interest, of which we funnel down into those that have got a terminal illness. And there are some questions that we'd be sort of keen to go through with you just to really get a sense of whether or not it's going to be a safe process for you. Then we sort of drill down into, right, what kind of mental health um, issues are they bringing along to us? Has a doctor ever told you that you may have a condition called psychosis or schizophrenia or uh, bipolar disorder, no. anything like that? No. Okay. No. People who have a psychosis, people who have bipolar, we know that, that it can be unsafe for them. But on top of that, there are people who have got perhaps raw and unprocessed trauma. We've got to be really careful there because people can be re-traumatised. You have to do... We're going to reschedule. The therapy itself is quite unusual in that you see two therapists. And that was really weird for us. Like, we were friends, we'd been friends, we'd worked together for about eight years together. And then we've got someone else coming in the same uh, time. Ah, uh, OK. But we'd never actually done therapy side by side. So it was kind of exposing. It was like, weird. Oh, what's, what's he saying that for? Why is she saying that? And there's this weird kind of tussle. We've got that meeting. Don't look at that. No. I'm a clinical psychologist. Justin is a psychiatrist and... Our training is very different. Very, <laughs> very different. different. Things happened and I would be sitting there going, oh, well, what do I do now? And then the head be sitting yep. there and, you know, just letting things, you know, and it's fine, silence is, you know, we do that too. Golden. Golden. golden yeah. Ground floor. Marg and Justin complement each other really well. Hi, Lenny. Marg is physically much more animated and exudes warmth and excitement. And, and Justin really listens quite seriously and takes it all in. And then he'll say something that's so profound and so just on the mark. They're a good team, artful, artful in what they do. When we have a participant start in the study, usually we'll spend the first session really getting to know them, their story, who they are, what makes them who they are, um, the story of their illness um, and how that's come to impact their life. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you 
doing? Welcome back. Yes, thank you. Lindy is one of 35 participants that we've had through the study. And I think Lindy was really highly motivated and that's the way that you get that sort of longer lasting um, change in mood and, and perspective. To participate in the trial, it's actually really hard yakka. You've got to come along to us for a week. And it's not just the coming along physically, it's also to the sort of psychological preparedness to go through the process because it's really gruelling. Like, we go, hopefully, into all of these corners of your life and it's a very confronting process. So it's finally here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. How are you feeling? Good. Really good. A little bit nervous, but not scared. So we have three preparation sessions and we do it in consecutive days. And then we have the first dose. And then we have an integration the next morning. It's almost like a retreat, in a way. Bring your attention to what you're hoping the experience may bring. Yeah. The dose day is a really powerful and intense experience. And so we need to lead people into it slowly. And I know that we've talked about the breathing technique that you've given me that I've been practising. Prior to the dose day, you go and you have face-to-face -face therapy with both of them in the room, both Justin and Mark. If you do find that something's challenging or it feels black or it feels malevolent or you don't like it or you're like, oh, I don't like this, if you fight it and go, no, I don't want this, or that's when it's going to kind of pick up even more. Okay. Lindy was so perfectly ready for this treatment. She just dove straight in. So the morning of the dose, they'd get here at about 8.30 and the room is sort of set up and they're, they're ready to go. And what we'd normally do is give them the, the capsule, not, not in my hand, we'd give it to them in a, in a cup. And as you can see, it's a totally nondescript, really bland looking piece of medicine, which you know, I think is perfect, you know, because there's just so much can come out of it. We use synthetic psilocybin made by a pharmaceutical company. It's a big dose, 25 milligrams. That's you? Yeah. It will produce a powerful, intense effect. In a scientific context, it's a, it's a whacking dose. I'd made a decision not to do a lot of reading about the effects of having mind-altering drugs. Um, I knew it would be an altered state, but I had no sense of what that might feel like. Yeah. 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 Yep, you lay down now. Mm. We'll get you ready. <clears throat> if you need more heat, anything at all, you let us know. We don't want them getting distracted by external stimuli, so one of the things that we do is we ask them to adopt eye shades, and then they have um, noise cancelling headphones, so the music's sort of piped in. And we'll start the playlist. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We've created a playlist that's very much designed to uh, work with the mechanism of the drug action. People have asked me what was it like and it's just so hard to actually articulate it into words. Very intense, exhausting, um, emotionally gruelling. Mark or Justin, mm -hmm. I think I need just a little break. Mm -hmm. It's so intense. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to get up. Yeah, gather yourself. Oh my me. God. <laughs> Excuse my French, but just... fuck me. <laughs> oh my Lord. Oh, you can be intense. Bloody hell. Yeah. Thank you, friend. I feel like I'm losing my breath and my momentum and I don't want yeah. to. I'm like, I keep wanting to... You know what? Your breath mm. will just do itself. You don't have to worry about that. You're doing so yeah. good, Lindy. You're doing really good. So good. Oof. Yeah. It was the most intense emotional thing I've ever done in my life. They don't call it 20 years of therapy for nothing, oh. do they? <laughs> This took me to places that I didn't know I had inside my head and inside my my emotions. Mm. Here we go. Okay, okay. Thank you. It took
took me there to a point where it was so intense that the desire to come out of it was really, really strong. And I remember saying to myself, I'm never going to get this to do this again, lean into it. And so that's what I tried to do. I tried to be really strong and just lean into it. When there was the really dark moments, it felt like I was losing my breath, that I was being actually um, held down or smothered by weight and a lot of darkness. And it all, it all married with the music. Okay. Music off, please. No, don't leave me there. Oh, God, I don't fucking know. You know what, let's have a, oh. let's have a pause. Let's all have right. a pause. We can always oh. go back in in a minute. We'll have a pause, yeah? There would be so much emotion in there. The last it's a time. lifetime. It's Maybe. a lifetime. It's a lifetime of feeling. Because you're in this altered state, you can look at that bit of yourself that always felt dark, unbearable, unwanted, and you can embrace and you can, you can care and you can love. Um, you can have conversations with figures that have been really troubling for you and you can confront things like death. It's so weird that no one was there. The psychedelic took me places that I don't think I would have been able to access by myself. Those two kids. Mm. Yeah. Oh. And then also on the lighter side of the psychedelic was this joy and wonderment and curiosity and all the things that I love about myself and that I value about my life. And that was so nice too to be in that as well and just sort of look at it with these very different eyes. The places you've been. The oh. heart's beating perfectly. Yeah, it's doing everything it needs to be done. I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm grounded. I'm just yeah. happy to. Yeah. To still be mm. in yeah. it. I don't want to come out of it. No. Having a diagnosis of a terminal illness, people don't want to talk about it. So the therapy has really helped me to share those thoughts and feelings with somebody and to get it off my chest. And that's made such a big difference. But the other thing that the therapy's done is it took me back. It took me back to things in my childhood. It took me back to things in my early adulthood. Um, and they were really important things. They are really important things to address so that the time I've got left, I can be as emotionally well and robust and, and content as I, as I can be. change to Australia's drug law, psychedelic substances, MDMA and psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms, will be made legal for therapeutic use. In February, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA, rescheduled psilocybin. Oh, they're just um, talking at night about the TGA. Previously, it could only be used as part of a clinical trial like ours. But as of the 1st of July, it will be available to be prescribed by authorised psychiatrists for the treatment of particular kinds of depression. This, I think, blindsided everyone. <laughs> I don't... Um, it was early, uh, I have to say. My colleagues and I at PRISM are, are frankly fairly concerned about the implications of this decision by the TGA at this particular point in time. We've always been supportive of the, of the rescheduling of the compounds, but we feel that the, the timing uh, is not really appropriate. It's going to be quite an undertaking to uh, train enough therapists uh, over the next few years to meet demand. In terms of 
advocating for this therapeutic work, it comes with a note of caution. So although I can see the benefit in it, I can also see too that it's not for everybody, as it's not for every therapist. If I wasn't emotionally robust before I went into it, I actually feel like it could have done a lot of damage. It's got to be done really well. It's got to be done by therapists who really, really know their stuff. The work has required every minute of training I've ever had, and then it's forced me to learn a lot more. Going along and simply doing a week-long course into the use of psychedelic medicine, it's the same as going and doing a course on how to replace one of the valves in the heart and then thinking you can just go out and do those procedures. We need one bad experience that hits the media and then they shut the doors again. We're back where we started, back in 1970. So we need to get it right. We've got one shot at this. We have one shot at this. So we're going to do this permit today. It's our last one. It's our last one, yeah. I feel completely changed by the experience of this trial. I am not the same psychiatrist I was before. The interviews yeah. as well. It's been profound. I can't begin to put words around how it's personally impacted me. Okay. Coming to the end of the study now, we've had 35 people go through, and obviously it's too early to give lots of detail about what those results will bring until it's peer reviewed and analysed. But certainly from a clinical point of view, we've seen really clinically meaningful change happen. The things that really stand out are those people where they've felt as though they can now accept their death as a normal part of life. They feel that they can deal with the everyday sort of ups and downs of their illness without being so burdened by emotional pain. I needed something different, and this has been the perfect fit for me. Medically, I'm worse off than I was when I started the therapy, but I physically feel more well. I would say that I've laughed more in the last few weeks and smiled more in the last few weeks than I have since, I don't know, two and a half years. It's such a nice feeling. She's a lot more relaxed and kind of just goes with the flow. Yeah, so Doesn't get caught up on the little things as much, which is nice that she's less stressed and anxious about everything. Yeah. Mm. I think she understands herself a bit more, if that makes sense. Good girl. Come on. Come on. She's been able to put things into her everyday life now that make her feel like she's creative, which she is that she's connected and loved, which she very clearly is, and that she's got something to offer. She's not just somebody with a cancer diagnosis. <laughs> it's changed everything. It's changed my whole outlook on life. It's changed how I interact with people. There's this lightness and peace that I wasn't experiencing before I started the study. She's exceptionally grateful for her days and her days with her kids, and uh, that's lovely to see. I have this short period of time, undefined, and the days when I couldn't get out of bed, it just made me feel so guilty that I wasn't taking the opportunity to, to live a big life. I've always lived a big life. And to have been given the opportunity to do something that makes such a difference to how I live that life from now going forward. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that I was chosen. Mm -hmm.